we will call tonight's meeting to order. Um, the first order of business is to elect yeah. a committee chair. And I'll throw out the first nomination. I nominate Charlie Easthem. Second. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Hearing none, I will turn the meeting over to Director Easthem. Yeah, thank you, President Wall. Uh, do we need to have a introductions count? Not necessarily, no. Nope. Okay. All right, so the next item on the agenda is approval of minutes for the November 14, 2023 meeting of this committee. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any additions or corrections or comments any committee members wish to make about the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes, please say aye. 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 And approves, please say nay. And the minutes are approved. Staff and efficiency data is the next item. I'll uh, turn it over to Matt. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, we tonight are going to talk to you guys a little bit about, as the title says, staffing and efficiency data. So um, I we don't have it linked up on there, at least it's not showing up on my version of Board Docs yet, but we will uh, here tonight after the meeting plan to link this. We sh shared it with admin council this afternoon, so they had an opportunity to ask questions or potentially um, give us any, any questions that we needed to adjust on the presentation or inf any information they thought um, needed to be uh, changed or any edits that we'd want to provide before that. So we were working on it throughout the day as the uh, short of what I was trying to uh, state there. Adam and Nick are going to do the majority of the presenting here tonight and I think what you'll see is some information that will help inform the suggestions or ideas uh, we bring for the 27th meeting about potential budget reductions ideas. And so this is really a kind of a level set to just have a common understanding about what district data shows us and uh, where our staffing levels are at. Um, some of the questions that you guys might have about those levels either historical or moving forward and then also some building efficiency data. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Adam. He's gonna start us off. All right, thank you. Um, as Superintendent Degner shared, we're going to be talking about a few different things. Just a quick overview. I'll share some comparisons with other UEN districts. That's the Urban Education Network and specifically the 10 largest districts in the state of which we are one. Um, we'll also share staff FTE and enrollment data along with students per staff data, data, so staffing ratios, and then um, information as it relates to building capacity. So just to provide a little context, um, one of the things that's important as we look at our budget and the need for reductions and how we can get there, um, it's important to note that about 86% of our general fund budget is uh, expended on personnel related costs. Um, statewide, that percentage is between 79 and 80 percent, so we are substantially higher than most <coughs> districts around the state. Um, and that really, uh, you'll see how that unfolds as we go through some of the data in this presentation in terms of why that is the case. Um, and, you know, potentially then leading into a discussion about uh, ways to approach budget reductions with that in mind. So really quick, this is an expenditure comparison um, between ICCSD and the other nine largest districts in the state. So the chart on top is the um, per student expenditures by area. So the top row there is general fund expenditures overall and then broken down administration instruction and so forth down, the, down to transportation. As you look at uh, both of these charts actually, um, you really want to be in the blue more so than in the orange. The blue is really more efficient, um, so lower costs on that top chart, and then the bright orange is less efficient. Uh, as you look through Iowa City, you see we, we don't have um, a lot of uh, bright colors in either direction. We do have bright blue for transportation where our costs are substantially lower than the other 10 largest districts. Um, however, for the most part, we're sort of middle of the pack in terms of our overall general fund expenditures. Um, as you look at districts like Waukee and Ankeny, these are rapidly growing districts. They have a lot of the dark blues here, and um, that's largely driven by the f a couple of factors. One is 
um, efficiency in the way they've constructed their schools. They have large elementary schools, new and fairly efficient elementary schools, um, and so that shows up in their overall cost data. Um, but then also there's a little bit more po uh, less positive factor there, which is lagging funding for Iowa school districts that are growing. So this is something we used to face uh, more so than we do now, where funding lags enrollment by a year. And so that impacts districts like Waukee and Ankeny disproportionately. Um, conversely, if you look at Des Moines or Cedar Rapids, Council Bluffs, um, you see a lot more bright oranges or dark oranges. And those are districts where they have higher costs, um, you know, really across most or all of these areas. Um, one thing I would point out is as you look across the districts at general fund, that number varies quite a bit from one district to another. Um, you might ask, you know, how can that be in a district where we establish, you know, here's how much districts are allowed to spend on a per student basis. An important thing to keep in mind, though, is that that, as we've discussed it, as it relates to our budget reduction conversations more broadly, is influenced by factors like federal funding um, that contribute to spending authority. So as you look at Des Moines' number at 16,083, one of the reasons that it can be that high is uh, that they're receiving substantially more federal dollars per student than a district like ICCSD or even to a greater degree a district like Waukee. Um, and then the other factor that I would point to is that these are per student expenditures, not necessarily per student authority. Um, so as we know, we have peer districts that have substantially higher unspent balances than we do. And so potentially they're not spending all of the money that's available to them um, in terms of general fund expenditure. The bottom section of this chart is the same concept, but it's a statewide ranking. Again, you really want to be in the blues or at least the you know light shaded blue area there. Um, and so uh, you, as you look at ICCSD, um, transportation jumps out. That's an area where we rank 325th out of the roughly 330 districts in the state um, in uh, expenditures per student. So. Um, we spend very little compared to a typical district on transportation. Most of the other rankings, we are pretty middle of the road, especially when you compare to um, other UEN districts. Um, there are some outliers. For example, um, support staff. All of the top 10 districts rank high in terms of support staff. Um, there are a number of reasons that drive that. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, simply because it's a departure from previous years, one of the things that showed up in our previous year reports was our administration ranking was always very, very low, like last, second to last um, in that ballpark. Our administrative expenditures have not increased substantially from last year to this year, even two years ago to this year. Um, but our ranking is 181. Uh, that's possibly due to movement within other districts. It's also possibly due to how that ranking was calculated in previous years, and I can't really speak to that. Um, but this does appear to be um, accurate. It does place us, you know, roughly in the middle um, or a little bit in the lower half of the 10 largest districts here. Um, but at the same time, it's not necessarily the number that you've probably gotten used to seeing in terms of that administrative expenditure ranking. Um, I'll pause for a second. Any questions on this slide? Yeah. So, Adam, can you just talk for a second, maybe with that, about why these comparisons are important to us? So I would jump in. Feel free to jump okay. in if there's anything else. Um, I would say that one of the big reasons that they're important to us is that they're a part of a picture that I think will be painted by the, the volume of data that we'll share here tonight. So this provides some context for um, what the outcome is based upon some of our staffing ratios, um, salary numbers, things like that. Uh, the other factor is that it's important to remember that in Iowa, like I said, with the exception of certain miscellaneous income, districts are funded at the same level. Um, I think sometimes people have a perception like is true in many states that you have wealthy districts and you have poorer districts and you know so you might spend more but you also generate more it's not a big deal. Iowa doesn't operate that way we all operate with the same you know base per student funding level so when we see substantial uh, discrepancies from one district to another from our district to state averages it may indicate 
efficiency or lack of efficiency, it may indicate a greater need or lack of need. So this to me is all just part of that context and understanding where our, our money is going and how that compares to what who we consider peer districts. So do we have a, a ranking of the percent of the district's general fund that's used for personnel, which is one of the primary percentages that we have that we refer to? So I do not have a ranking of that necessarily. However, um, I do know that we are substantially above average, and that was one of the, that 86 cents per dollar that was shared in the first slide um, compared to a statewide average of about 80 cents per dollar. Um, so we spend far greater percentage of our general fund budget on personnel than a typical district in Iowa. What I don't have is that broken down as an actual ranking from first to last. Mitch has one there. Uh, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. uh, where does this data come from? Mm -hmm. Is the state's data, and what? And this follow up to it is: what year is it? Academic year twenty three or twenty four? Yep. So this is the state's. It's data we report to the state, okay. and it's standardized. All districts report it in the same manner, using the same definitions. Um, it's part of our beds reporting uh, that we do in the fall, and this is uh, current year data. So okay. this is this year. Thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna move to talking a little bit about staff FTEs. And this chart uh, shows two things. It shows enrollment growth and also um, all staff FTE growth. So this includes all positions in the district. And this is all um, benchmarked against the year 2011. So 2011 is set at 0% for both lines. And then you can see the orange line here is our enrollment growth as a district since 2011. And the blue line, it's blue, right? Yes. Thank you. The blue line is our staff FTE growth since 2011. So if you look, this is, again, a reminder, this is all positions in the district. Um, but through roughly 2017, our staff FTE numbers roughly tracked in terms of the growth since 2011, tracked our enrollment growth over that time. So the trend lines even through 2018 are pretty similar. Um, but after that point, or actually through 2017 are pretty similar. Um, after that point, we see a substantial departure um, where we start to see our staff FTE growth uh, significantly outpace our enrollment growth, which was continuing through that point, um, but starting to slow a little bit. Um, and then uh, if you recall, um, in 2019 was really our last round of significant budget cuts. And so we engaged in reductions at that point. And this is a good um, visual uh, image of why we had to engage in those budget reduction conversations. Yes. It's just a question for when people open this up. Mm -hmm. The percentages are compared to 2011. Yes. So that would be like 24% enrollment growth in 2023 compared over 2011, not? Correct, okay. yes, that's correct. Yes. Well, can you define the universe of staff? Are we certified staff? This is all staff so positions, all positions, plan, period. Nutrition yes. Surfers? Okay. Yep. yep, so this one includes all staff. Um, as you can see though, we made reductions following 2019. Uh, the plan there was really to get this line down to the enrollment line, which also we expected to continue to increase at that point. Um, that's when COVID happened. And so our enrollment takes a dive uh, post-COVID, and our staff FTE continues to grow, and that was largely funded through ESSER. Um, and, you know, a, a decision made, you know, on the part of the district to um, put more staff into the classroom to deal with COVID-related learning loss and that sort of thing. Um, so either way, we see these, these uh, lines continue to diverge. <coughs> Getting to the question um, about what type of staff we are looking at, I do have a couple of charts that break this down for specific types of positions. So um, this is growth in general ed teachers, um, FTE, during the same time period. And so looking at this, you can see some of the same trends, but it's a much more muted difference between um, the FTE growth compared to the enrollment growth. So again, we see again a very similar trend line really all the way through 2018. 2019 starts to diverge, 
that's when the budget reductions happen. And you can see the effect of those budget reductions where it gets basically down to the same, you know, same point. We're back on that, that same trend line. Um, but then COVID happens, our enrollment drops, our regular ed, general ed teacher FTE grows. And so again, we see this departure. Uh, this chart also though shows the impact of the budget reductions we made coming into this year. Um, so again, we made reductions coming into this year. That's why you see uh, this general ed teacher FTE number decline from last year to this year. Um, so there is some impact there in terms of reductions we've already made showing up. Um, however, again, our enrollment since COVID has not quite recovered to pre-COVID levels. Um, so there's still a substantial departure between these two lines. And then the final uh, version of this chart that I'll show is growth in our paraprofessional FTE. And this is one that, again, jumps out. It's a little less clean um, early on. We have a little fluctuation up and down. Um, but then a substantial uh, divergence that begins um, right around 2016. And uh, again, a reduction with that first round of budget reductions, um, but then continued increase. This is a large group and really drives a lot of that district-wide all staff look at um, the divergence between our staffing FTE and our enrollment growth. One thing that's important to note is about 85% of our paraeducators are funded out of special ed. And so those are not necessarily contrib contributing directly to our general fund unspent balance issues because a dollar spent in special education creates a dollar of authority. Um, but either way, as we look at overall system growth, staffing growth, this is a big driver of that. Um, one thing I would point out is that, you know, one of the drivers, and certainly Ashley could speak to this more than I can, is the move to providing services within the home schools um, for all types of services, which drove a need for additional paraeducators uh, within the district. And what year did that go into effect? I, was it 2016? Does anyone recall? Okay, so right around this period on the chart, so where we see that really substantial growth occurring. Adam, what is yes. the, the final number for growth compared to 2011? Yep, so it's about 85%. So an 85% increase in paraeducators. Correct. Okay, yep. thank you. Adam, will you go back and talk about new building openings too? Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. <coughs> One other thing I would highlight here, um, as we see, you know, that deviation from being, you know, actually a little bit below enrollment is that this is also a period in time where we see the opening of several buildings, several schools. So um, Alexander opened in, I believe, 2015. Um, Liberty opened in 2017, uh, as did Hoover. And then Grant opened in 2021. One. Yep. Um, so during this time, we had the opening of four schools, and that certainly contributed as well as opening of the online program. All right, this chart will take a little bit of explanation, um, but what this is showing is the same thing really that the previous three charts were showing, but broken down by school. Apologies that this is so small on the bottom, like was shared, we'll get this uploaded so you can zoom in. Um, but what this is showing is essentially um, by school over the past four years, our change in enrollment versus the change in staff FTEs assigned to that school. So for example, this very first one, which I, again is hard to read, so I apologize for that. Um, but this very first one down here is Alexander Elementary. They're just in alphabetical order. So over the past four years, Alexander's enrollment is down about 25%. That was due to a rezoning that occurred during that time. Um, their staff FTE is down about 26.5%. So it's a very small bar. It's only a 1.5% difference between those two. And it's in the blue direction, which means that their staffing actually decreased more than their enrollment did. Um, so where you see a blue, a blue um, bar, that's what that indicates. So another one would be man, <coughs> excuse me, um, which is down, you know, a little bit under 5%. Um, in terms of enrollment, um, but down about 25% in terms of staffing in that school. Uh, man is this blue, large blue bar right here, yep. 
Um, the red bars, which are most schools in the district, are situations where enrollment growth or decline um, was below whatever the staff change was. So, for example, here at Shimmick, um, enrollment growth was down about 7%, while staff FTE growth was up about 20%. And that's the more common case in most of our schools. Um, and that's not surprising, given the previous charts that we looked at where we saw that staff FTE growth substantially outpace our enrollment growth district-wide. Um, there are a handful of factors that contribute to some of these being larger than others. Um, implementation of the RAM, especially for schools that are kind of in the middle, um, can result in you know just a few students tipping over an entire staff FTE. So there's a factor there. Certainly growth in paraeducators, as we just looked at, would be a contributing factor here as well. This is the same, but it's looking only over the past year. And um, I actually do want to point out before you get drawn to this giant red bar down here, um, this is the online program, and that's actually not quite correct data. The way re we report data to the state for the BEDS report can only count a student in one building if they have a secondary enrollment. Most of our schools, this is a non-issue, um, but the online program has a disproportionate number of secondary enrollments. So their enrollment is really higher than what this would indicate here. Um, so that, oops, sorry, that uh, giant red bar is not really indicative. Um, but one of the things I wanted to highlight here is that, again, with our budget reductions coming into this year, you see a whole lot more blue bars on this chart where our enrollment change over the past year um, was higher than what our, or ended up at a higher level than what our staff FTEs did. So again, for an example here, uh, if you look at Alexander Elementary, it's up 8% in enrollment. Um, but then the staff FTE is down about 8%, and so that's a net negative 16% resulting in that blue bar. Here, moving back to um, the comparison to the other 10 largest districts, and this really starts to bring this and the next graphic will bring that 86% number into um, some clarity, I think. Uh, so as we look at the 10 largest district, this is students per instructional staff FTE. So on the efficiency side, um, not making a value judgment about that, but on the efficiency side, um, you really want to be higher on this. You want more students per instructional staff FTE. Um, as you can see, ICCSD is the second lowest of the top 10 districts. The only district that's lower is Dubuque. So the average here is 14.9. For the 10 largest districts, ICCSD is about 13.3. Uh, so um, we have more staff per student than all but one other of the 10 largest districts in the state. This is average salary of instructional FTE. And as you look here, um, one of the things that you'll, you might note is that Dubuque, which was the only school that's staffed at a higher level than us, also, though, has the lowest salaries for instructional staff FTE. So that's how they're paying for that, is they're staffed at a higher level, their compensation is lower. ICCSD is staffed at the second highest level, and as you can see, um, has the highest average salary for instructional staff FTE. So again, this is just instructional staff. Um, you know, we can look at this across groups, um, but this is really a big driver for that personnel cost being 86% compared to a statewide average of about 80%. I'll pause for a second. Any questions on this? All right. So we're going to actually shift directions a little bit <clears throat> related to now looking at uh, more school-based uh, information and looking particularly at all of our schools. Uh, this is similar to our previous one, but it's not dealing with just instructional staff, it's all staff. So in this particular slide, it's looking at all staff except for custodians and technology staff, which are kind of allocated throughout the district. It does account for nutrition staff, interestingly enough. So in our production kitchens, at our high schools, Northwest Junior High, and then to some degree at Southeast and North Central, it does impact this number. But what it is, is calculating you know, how many students do we have per staff member in each one of our um, buildings. So our 
you know, the largest number there is at Christine Grant Elementary, slightly over 10 students per uh, employee at Christine Grant. And then it ranges down to the lowest being Hills at about 3.8 students per staff member in that building. If you look um, throughout this chart, you kind of see our secondary buildings kind of land in the middle of the chart. Our, some of our larger elementaries are towards the, the top end of this chart. And then there's uh, kind of an obvious pattern of some of our smaller elementaries down at the, the lower end of this chart, uh, along with uh, Tate High School, which is obviously there with some, you know, that's a programmatic decision, you know, to have uh, the class sizes and the number of staff that we have there to serve our alternative high school. So you can kind of see some patterns within this, which then <clears throat> led us to start to look at some things maybe a little bit more in particular at our elementary level. So we're going to look more specifically at some of our elementary levels with some of the data that we have. Um, so to look at these next pieces or these next slides, just looking at a base cost calculation to run an elementary school or to have an elementary site open, you need a principal. We have a head custodian, classroom teachers for each classroom that there would be, you know, yeah, that we're allocating and then everyone gets a support staff allocation of a certain amount so in this in these calculations we actually use the building's actual support staff allocation times roughly seventeen dollars an hour to get a, a basic there and then as we look at the next year we took a small portion of that support staff hours away to account for the fact that the you know the building would be a little bit smaller so some general approximations there so those are like consistent factors. All those factors also come out of our general fund. So that's one of the reasons why we selected to highlight those. We're not looking at specials. We're not looking at special ed teachers. We're not looking at anything else. It's just these costs. So to use that then, <clears throat> this year, you'll see we have a wide array of costs per student within our buildings. When you look at the base costs within our buildings, you'll see everything from a couple buildings right around $6,400 per child to educate them just on the base costs alone. And then you'll see a number of buildings where it is about $4,100 to $4,200 per child. Uh, you might wonder, you know, that's far, a far gap away from what, what the state allocates. It's because we're not accounting for all those other factors. We're just looking at that small amount. So that's why it's not closer to that 7,000, whatever the exact number is the state provides. You'll see the orange line that goes across the middle, kind of that orange area. That's our average. We're slightly under 5,000 is our average across. If you look at all of our elementary sites, that's currently what we average on a cost per student basis. The next slide would be, you know, one of the things we're going to gain some efficiencies as we move to middle schools and the middle schools, but we are going to have, it is going to impact us a little bit then at our elementary schools because we won't have our sixth graders. So you'll see in some cases, some numbers really change if you look through this graph. A number of our buildings will still stay relatively in the lower. Our average does go up a little bit. It goes a little over 5,000 because we're losing, we're losing students. So if you're thinking about cost per student, some of those fixed costs remain the same. Um, in some cases, you may see a lower number in that situation. It's probably because we're anticipating there may be a reduction of staff in that building or they have a large sixth grade class and their kindergartens coming in are smaller. So, oh, they're losing three sections and we're anticipating two or some others. Because a lot of times as neighborhoods, you know, age out a little bit, we end up just having less kindergartners. And, you know, some of our schools we know will have four sections and our schools will be lucky to get two. Um, so you look at these different pieces as we work through this. So that's kind of our anticipated plan. You'll see again, um, in this particular case, Hills jumps up over about $7,000 per student to educate a child uh, just on the base cost alone. And then Hoover remains pretty consistent at about that 4,100 uh, roughly as one of our more efficient sites related to the cost per child. Um, and then this is just simply an overlay of those two numbers. So you can see uh, the ones where you can see orange above the blue, They're those are where the costs are going up. Where you see a little bit of blue, or in some cases quite a bit of blue, there's probably something happening with their staffing related to um, like I described before, the sixth grade changing, or it's we're anticipating that we may reduce the number of staff members in that building. Um, but we're, we'll work through that as we get closer to some of our traditional registration, kindergarten registration, and staffing timelines that will be ahead of us here in the next month. Um, I'm going to really kind of shift gears to a capacity piece, but before I do that, any questions on these cost per student slides at all? Yeah. No. 
No, no operational cost. It is surely just taking a, a standard value for a principal, a standard value for a custodian, a standard value for all teachers, and then the support staff times seventeen dollars. So it's trying to keep it as just approximately we just what we use for our budget approximations on all those things. We didn't get into the very fine detail of looking at okay, this is what every teacher makes at you know Lemmy, but just doing some general approximations there. Yes. Oh, I was just never mind. Oh, okay. Others. I guess the, the question that would come to mind when you go back to the which one? The, this one? The slide of the people that you're using. Yes. It's a principal, head custodian, mm -hmm. classroom teachers. In, and you don't, may not have this off the top mm -hmm. of your head, but what is the average principal? What is the average head custodian, the average classroom teacher? <laughs> so for principal, I think we use, because we were also using you know, benefits and such yep. in general. Yep, so yep. we did 150 for a principal. We said head custodian, I, I'd have to double check my numbers mm -hmm. on that. I want to say it was about $50,000. Classroom teacher, I was using ninety, and then seventeen dollars an hour for the the support staff. Okay. And kind of general average. There's a range within those those positions. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, switching gears, we'll look at some capacity conversations as well. Obviously, as we're losing students from our elementaries to the middle school, it's going to create some some room in our various elementary schools. So, in this particular graphic, you'll see. The orange kind of line that goes up and down, that's the capacity of the building as, as we've documented thus far. And then the blue is what we anticipate the pre-K enrollment being, uh, pre-K five enrollment being next school year. For pre-K, we didn't double count, we have, so we went with whatever their largest number was. So if the AM had 20 and the PM this year had 18, we said, oh, that counts as 20. And we just included that in because we wouldn't have 38 students there at one time. They're only using one classroom space so, but we also, and then for any of our buildings that did not have preschool this year and would next year, I think I estimated about 18 and just added 18 into all those. So that way it was accounting for some preschool students in this capacity number. So you'll see where you see in these larger chunks of orange, we have a fair amount of room, like at a Grant Wood where it's 312 um, is our anticipated enrollment next year. Uh, we have room up to about you know, over 500 students, according to what we would say related to capacity uh, for classrooms. So we have a fair amount of capacity, and this is one way to look at. The next slide is just a different visual where we're looking at it really in, in clusters or in groups of how uh, these five buildings that you see up here are below 60% capacity, the Kirkwood, Alexander, Twain, Lucas, and Chimic. Uh, then we have another grouping below 70, and then we have a group over here between 70 and 90 that are, you know, using a larger portion of the building. Sometimes as you look at this, it's good to then look and say, how are we looking geographically or within a, how we zone our students? So if we're talking about middle schools, you know, our north central zone or that feeder pattern generally is looking at about 69% of their uh, space is being used. There's still 31% that would be available in that. A lot of times we think North Liberty large schools, there's probably not some space, but there actually is some schools available. And this is looking at the elementary schools again. Uh, Northwest zone has about 73% usage, Southeast is at 71%, and then across our district we're using about 70% of our elementary capacity. I believe when we were looking at it, we anticipate having 6,000 some odd students next year at the elementary level and we have space for over 9,000. So as you think about that, um, that's a pretty critical um, piece of information as we look at what, what we have um, and with these adjustments to middle schools, what space that then makes available in our elementary schools. So that just leads us to the tail end. I don't know if there's any closing comments anyone else would want to add, but that's kind of what we have to put in front of you. I know that's a lot to put in. I did give the PDF to Kim so we can get that uploaded. So you it's all, it's, oh, it's there, it sounds now. So that way you can look at it and see all the fine print on some of those graphs. So maybe just to close the last point, I think one thing, you know, that would be a natural question there is, okay, well, if we have that much capacity, why do some of our buildings seem full right now, or why is every classroom used? So, of course, one of those answers is sixth graders going to middle schools, but the other one would be how we staff, right, and the decisions we make around staffing directly relates to our RAM plan. So something you will see, a, see from us, you know, when you come back on the 27th is how we could look at the RAM differently or some proposed ideas on that. And so while we're not ready, obviously, to share 
that method with you tonight. Um, I, I do think that would be a natural thing to expect and, and ask for out of this question is, okay, if we have this capacity, then what are the things that are influencing that those decisions uh, into our staffing plan now and how could we potentially look at that different knowing we're having to go through some reduction. So that could be one um, element you'd anticipate next time. How is capacity determined? Is it 32 students times number of classrooms, 25 students times number of classrooms or? Yeah, so it's determined and the physical plant maintains a capacity mm -hmm. document that has this, but it's based upon number of classrooms, square footage of those classrooms, and then depends upon the grade levels served in the building. So the amount of space required per student for a high school classroom is different from the amount of square feet required per elementary student in a classroom. But based upon that, um, they basically do a by classroom capacity calculation um, and develop that number for the school. And that's been, I think we've been doing capacities consistently now for at least five or six years. We first did it when we did FMP 1.0. We were so far uh, behind the curve that they did a large analysis on that uh, square footage model. So initially 12 years ago, I guess, is when that started. What I don't know is that they've updated or changed that formula since then, but they went away from just kind of that standard 25 kids per class, per number of classrooms in the building during the FNP 1.0 process. How many students per class? Or they went away from that to the yeah. square footage model. Right. So I, I'm just wondering because it seems... Like, it could be a little unfair to say that 50% of the building is being utilized if that would mean to to reach 100%, you're talking about classrooms of 40 students. Yeah, my understanding, that's, that's where I'm trying yeah, to my understanding is we don't have any circumstances that are like that. Okay. Um, and so... Uh, it was yeah. kind of then. So they went away, because the other model was unfair, because every classroom isn't the same size. And so when they were going... 25 students mm -hmm. per classroom at a, one of some of our older buildings, the classrooms were much smaller than they were at some of our, our newer buildings. And so just by taking in the exact square footage, you're saying that every kindergartner is entitled to 10 square feet. No, right, and that's kind of what it is. No matter the size of the classroom, it should be proportionate because the larger the classroom, you'd only put more students in it based on that same equation working out, whereas mm -hmm. If you put 25 in every classroom, obviously a smaller classroom would shrink that available space per student and expand it um, the larger the footprint is. And that was the, that was the exact problem is the one they were trying to solve. Okay. Sorry, I was just going to add, in my previous role as an elementary principal, I always found that it was relatively conservative, too. As you looked at the numbers, like Eliza's nodding her head there, I think when we're looking at capacity, we're not looking at, okay, let's see how many kids can we cram into the space. It's really... You know, here's a the 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 numbers that are used is very much a you know kind of a standard or what we would hope for a standard class size. I thought you were going to ask a different question. We also only use the instructional spaces, so okay. we're not counting the mechanical rooms yeah. in the yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. people yeah. do that, right? Like, I mean, yeah. some of that, so it, it comes out odd, but we don't take into effect the kitchen or the mechanical spaces. We try to so just the classroom mm -hmm. spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I'm struggling with is trying to relate academic achievement to the picture that you outlined for us tonight. And uh, I strongly suspect you're considering academic achievement too. Looking at this way, uh, these uh, pictures of the district's physical size, physical capacity, numbers of students, numbers of staff members. Um, and I don't know if you're seeing a clear relationship between um, cost per student in different schools with academic achievement in those different schools. Or if you're going to leave us to struggle with that well. <laughs> well, I think the piece we'd give you, Charlie, is, I mean, I do think Obviously, everything we do is, is focused around academic achievement, right, and trying to maximize um, the experience for kids and the results. And so I think when we have that RAM conversation, that's been a big part of that, is about when we decide how to staff and create an instruction plan for our schools, then how do we account in those factors that will maximize student achievement 
and then also considering our, our financial reality, right? So I think a straight like achievement versus cost analysis you won't see, but we've talked a lot about RAM and weighted resource allocation and knowing the impact that can have on, on student achievement. And so uh, when we get into a more robust conversation about that in a couple weeks and about what a potential change to that staffing plan can look like, I think you'll see or appreciate the multiple factors that we've considered into that. One, one thing I'd add, Matt, too, if you don't mind, um, yep. as we think about the achievement piece and different things related, you know, size does make a difference, too, as we're trying to implement some sort of weighted resource allocation okay, model, like and, and especially when some of our buildings end up at what I would consider like an awkward size, where no matter what we do with how we're going to level or organize the, the, the arrangement, that building's not impacted one way or another. They're going to be at that particular class size or those arrangements. They have 37 students in that particular grade level. We're not going to have a classroom of 37. So that's going to be two groups of 18 at all times. So there are some pieces in this that is a direct correlation to that. No, but it is a conversation that we have to look at if we're saying class size is part of that conversation. And some of that will come up. You'll notice, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the enrollment report. I'll be highlighting that later. I think you'll see some of those pieces in that as well. You know, one of the things that struck me was how you started the presentation, Adam. I, I kind of thought that our 86% number was state average, but it sounds like we're 6% above that. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, if, we can, if we can get closer to the state average, and that's 6% of our general of our of our funding that would go back into the general fund that we could then use correct correct for other types of student services more focused programs on academic achievement and and things that would maybe as the thought better serve our students and and better help meet our student needs if we can get our efficiencies a little bit under control that would free up funds to to push them to where they might be better used. Is that? I mean, am I yeah. Well, I, that? I think that would be the second iteration, right? The first iteration we're talking about trying to get that eighty-six, six, probably closer to eighty, is just to kind of right size the budget currently, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. And then the second one would be okay. Now, before we just jump to eighty-six again, or before you get that natural increase that jumps to the to eighty-six that we saw in those line graphs at the beginning, would be okay. What are the considerations of where we would spend those extra dollars? And you know, and I think there's always been an element in the district where we've we've recognized some above eighty percent because we do want to put it into our people and we do want those services closest to kids. Um, but there's other things that you guys have talked about, you know, for board goals too that could impact that. About are you satisfied with where the transportation costs are? Or is there additional things you'd want to do to try to get kids to school? How does that connect to chronic absenteeism or any of those things? And so there might be other measures you'd want to look at with that, but. Right now, in a sense, it's, it's stuck on that 86 and it doesn't give you a lot of movement, right? It doesn't protect you from uh, having an unspent balance that's in a healthy position. It doesn't give you the flexibility to increase in one of those other areas that I think you're mentioning. One, and if we don't look at right side in the budget with the 86%, we have to look at the 14%. And right. those are areas, when I go back to slide four, those are areas that we're blue at. So then it would be like, we'd have to be more efficient at transportation, which seems really hard to do because we're like almost the best in this state. You can do it, right? You know, yeah, if you like, go to any of those IASB's um, finance sessions, they will tell you that the further you get from 80%, the high, you know, you're, you're gonna run into financial problems. Yeah. Any, any district who's higher than 85%, you know, 80% and definitely higher than 85%, you eventually are going to run into budget difficulties. So it's so really the, that number right yeah, there. Yeah, that just seems yeah. like that's where the best shot at becoming more efficient is, is where we're above right. that being yeah. Yep. Yes. Right. <laughs> I, yeah, but I mean, you know, some of that, like on the transportation, I would imagine one reason we're really low is we have a lot of small neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. So Waukee is busing kids to these big, schools and, and, and the efficiency there is uh, if you have two schools of 250, that's two, double the principals, double the head custodian. You know, it's those, those are the, the inefficiencies of having small neighborhood schools, the financial inefficiency. And, and obviously we have to get the 86% and whether that's number of people. 
but if we reduce the number of people, now our class sizes are going to be, you know, there, so it's just, it's, there's a trade-off. Every, every piece we move, it's just there's going to be a balance on the other side. And so making those decisions, I mean, we don't have capacity problems other than too much capacity. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's never, I mean, usually it's been like we have to build a school. Right, so I really appreciate it. Frank, by the way, the just the visuals and the graphs, it really helped tell the story. Like it really was easy to see the comparisons. So it'll be interesting to see what your recommendations are. I, here's a question, when you guys come back with recommendations, are you gonna have like a range Super painful. Yeah. <laughs> they all hurt. Yeah. 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 I mean, I do think we'll, you know, if if we put them in those categories, I mean, I think there's still some recognition it's subjective, right? Because um, it's going to be painful to whatever program, school, staffing model, whatever it is. I mean, and so we wouldn't want to necessarily undersell that those don't hurt because everything we're doing now we know is good for kids, right? Or that we believe is good for kids and is trying to help kids. So there's all there's an impact to all of those uh, cuts that we would make. I do think, you know, part of what we'll probably try to frame it as these are potential ideas or suggestions right away, right? Like I don't think you're going to see us come back with hard and fast recommendations. I do. <clears throat> excuse me, because I think part of what we want to do is be able to have the conversation with you, right? Just similar to how we went through this process last year. If you tell us, hey, this isn't something we're interested in, that's fine. Then we need to shift gears to what some of our other options are, right? So I think from our perspective, we see our job as letting you know, here's the areas we could go, right? Here's where you can go to try to reduce those and whether or not that's something we want to pursue. Um, we may try to articulate some case for why we think you should look at that one. Uh, but to say these are going to be straight recommendations that this is really where um, we draw the line and say this is where we think you need to go. I don't think that's what our initial conversation will be, right? At some point, after you probably tell us, hey, no, we don't want to do those things, then we then it might be closer to a recommendation. Like, if you're really going to achieve this budget goal, we need to actionalize these things, or we need to revisit some that we pushed off the table at first. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, I think, you know, this is all efficiency and money, but look, you know, I do want to point out, look at what we're doing. We have top high schools in the state. We outcompete every single one of those districts in any number of metrics all over the place. Uh, and we know we've been threading our needle pretty tightly. And when we get to 86%, you know, that it just gets harder to thread. And eventually you just run out of space. Because that 14, how much of that is utility costs that, that we, you know, we got to heat our buildings? So we, we really get down to a super. Uh, and we're, I, we do quite a few extra things. Uh, and whether they're extra or not, I mean, I think we've determined they're necessary, the kinds of supports we have. Um, you know, we do include our special ed students, and that's sort of on paper inefficient when you spread those services out. And that's what we've decided, is that kids go to school in their neighborhood school, no matter what, what they've got, what they're coming in with, uh, as far as um, obstacles. So. So I just want to say we're doing a great job. We we gotta we've gotta figure it out. We've made budget cuts before. How we thread this needle? We've never been at 86 before. That to me is the one that's bumping up super high, uh, and, and and we'll find out a way to do that. But we, you know, I obviously I teach in Cedar Rapids. And they close schools all of the time. I mean, they have closed small schools where they gain that efficiency. And and as far as I know, that community, like if that happened here. Maybe they have 30 people at a school board meeting. We'll have 300 out the door. You know, it's just a different community mindset. I mean, that was the bond, was putting however million dollars into Lincoln, which is, by all measures, a super inefficient school and a really hard to get to place. And we spent money to make that like a state-of-the-art learning facility. Um, and so now we just, you know, some of this is, is how do we figure out where, where to go from here. Has the district been closer to 80 percent in the past? That's what I was going to ask, Adam. Do you have that historically? Yeah, I do not have it ready right now, but I can certainly pull that and get that to you. Uh, yeah. Charlie, or Dr. Eason, I think that's a product of where we spent our extra dollars. I think we all agree that we spent them the right way. Before going into that, we were not that high. We've always been kind of that 81, 82, but I think the spike in that um, percentage would probably align with what happened with COVID. Well, the graphs show that. 
the number of people. Right. Right. It would have been close, though. I mean, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we've always been, been, we've always been north of eighty. Yeah, but we we have yeah. Yeah. we've been closer than you thought. Okay, so it's a possibility in terms of our history. Well, I mean, you got better state funding at that point. I mean, I think there are some different realities, you know, that we have to take into account. That was probably when you were getting more from the state as well. And yeah, there's probably just some different things. But that used to be, you know, back. Yeah, I think we've been. We've, we've been in there, right? you know, but I'm not going to commit one way or the other. There we go. <laughs> we about had you. We yeah. about had you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 What are we talking about anymore? Yeah. 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 All I remember is that yeah. we've been in those. Other questions? We have three out of the top 15 schools in the state of Iowa. Because we pay our teachers well, mm -hmm. and we have relatively small mm -hmm. class sizes. Those two, those are the two things. Mm -hmm. And our number of parents probably is probably where we're. I mean, just being super frank, that's where the money is. But probably more so in our class sizes and our teachers. So, and our small and our and our small schools. That was pretty clear, I think, from the data too. Is that small schools are are driving a lot of operational inefficiencies. So one thing I think we'll need to consider, you know, I, I've referenced the 27th a couple times. March, we don't have a meeting until the end of the month, and that's going to seem like a really long time to go from the end of February till the end of March. And so when we look at, um, I think it's March 5th is the, that first Tuesday in March, we might want to do another financial oversight committee meeting at that time to revisit and have some conversation based on the suggestions we bring you. Uh, on the 27th, and, and they can have some more dialogue around it at that point. But we're going to want to have some type of a interim meeting in there between between the actual regular board meeting calendar. So, uh, can we just set that as a date, Charlie? If other people before you adjourn, <coughs> March 5th. <coughs> I like that. I mean, yeah. Do we need a motion? Fun, right? Just tell you what. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, do we need a motion? I don't. I don't think. I think we just need to. We can just calendar it. <laughs> before he adjourns. I don't see a lot of opposition. Nope. So there we go. So meeting. Yeah. I think five. Okay. March fifth. What's that? Yeah. March fifth. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You just gotta wait for Charlie to adjourn. Okay. Any other it's business? The board. Staff has. Oh, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any other business? No, we're good.